All right. In the ever-evolving saga of fucking battles going on, uh, there's this little-ass fucking gnat flying around my desk, and I just can't seem to fucking kill it. It's been like an hour. Shit pissing me off. <laughs> it's low-key restricting me. And I, I ain't trying to have it, like, fly into my mouth. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, hopefully I kill it in this episode. And that'd be uh, some good-ass content. Back from the stories and stuff like that. Um, Hello. Uh, this is episode number four, Sabeg's Garden. And as always, I'm the host, Sabeg. Uh, To warn myself this week, uh, let's start with a little bit of corrections. Last week I said annualize, but I meant to say analyze. I I don't really like to listen back on my episodes, but when I do, I just try to pick out what I'm not saying correctly and stuff like that. And that's the one thing that stuck out was that I said annualize, but I meant to say analyze. You know, I... Uh, another part of this little warming up segment, I just wanted to say, like, criticism is another form of love. And for me specifically, I'm really critical to the things I love. And I'm also really critical to myself, too. And I try to hold myself to a higher standard. And I would say, like, if you're looking on the outside, people see my criticism to myself as being, like, too hard on myself. But... Um, that's kind of what keeps me going. I, I kind of use that to help keep me going and pushing and stuff. And, um, I did just wake up from like a nap and just had a meal. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been a day. Uh, I have, um, some thoughts on my previous shows. Like I was saying a little bit. I don't really like to listen too much to myself. I I really actually hate it, especially when I'm editing. (laughs) I don't really like to do that. And I, um, and another thing is I feel like the episodes are kind of, are a little bit shorter than I would like, but you know, I have this weird habit of just thinking too much. You know, I just need to get all my thoughts out there without thinking too much about them. All right, but um, you know, other than that, let's just get on into what I wanted to talk about in this episode. So this first segment I got is I got I got it titled NFL Chronicles One. My relationship with the NFL and football it's kind of uh, started a little later than uh, NBA because I started really watching NBA back in like 2013, 14. I didn't really start watching football until oh like 2018 when i was 16 i decided to pick all my teams in all pro sports i already had basketball down as you guys know but it was time for me to choose an mlb and nfl team to really root for at the time i was really trying to get into all the sports so picking the teams in each respective sports was just a natural evolution everyone around me was a fan of bay area teams so naturally i just chose the dodgers and the rams the clippers are in la so it just felt right to choose those teams As I've grown older and wiser, I've just started to realize I love the idea of competition. Sports and sports organizations are a well-oiled, complicated machine, but on the outside, they are very simple. Um, They're two entities competing for a win. What I get stuck on is what it takes to win. As consumers, we only really see what we are shown. You know, personally, I've played basketball and volleyball in high schools, but that was a little while ago. And this is a side note, I was pretty fucking trash. But back then, I had no clue what it took to win. It was only until later I realized the main sacrifice is, like, everyone must be on the same page. You know, from the top of the roster all the way down to the bottom. If some people are only looking at themselves, then it's like pretty hopeless for the team. The collective unit is stronger than the individual pieces. In my opinion, athletes have to look within themselves 
leave their ego and pride aside, a.k.a. like numbers and stats. Honestly, you, you know, y'all might laugh, but I did not learn this idea of being like selfless for the team's success until I got into Siege, Rainbow Six Siege. But, you know, that game is for another segment. So I chose the Rams and honestly, it was just by a chance and they were an L.A. team. Um, my guy Ethan actually helped me pick out these teams. So if y'all are angry at me for being a Dodgers or Rams fan, <laughs> he's partially at fault. Skipping through the years, I sort of kept up with it. But like I said, like I was saying earlier, it wasn't until 2018 I really like cared about the Rams. But in that 2018 season, we were like really dominant. We finished 13 and three. You know, our receiving core was great. You know, wide receiver one was Cooper Cup, of course. But then we have uh, Brandon Cooks at two, and then Robert Woods is three. And yeah, like we we had the Ryan Gosling look like himself, Jared Goff. And this is also a side note, but I feel like his time in L.A. was underappreciated by Rams fans for sure, because he he did play some gems. And I know that the offense was kind of dumbed down for him because he is kind of like slow with his reads and his um throwing motion is kind of long. It was like he, he needed like really simple reads and stuff like that. And I feel like that was his bottleneck. But, you know, our running game was strong, too. Our defense had that good mixture of like bend but don't break that like you always hear. Aaron Donald was in his prime. But then against the Seahawks on November 11th, Cooper Cup tears his ACL. You know, in terms bumping up Brandon Cooks to wide receiver one and Robert Woods is wide receivers two. And um, to be honest, I feel like Todd Gurley <laughs> kind of fit that like wide receiver three option sometimes. Because he, he, he used to be like that switchback where it was like, he could play, or they might call it wide back now, the position that like Debo plays, plays like wide back because he might take a snap at like the running back or halfback position, or he might take a snap in like one of the receiver positions. <laughs> As you can, oh shit, I just seen it, motherfucker. It flew in my face. Oh my God. Like I was saying earlier, that motherfucker's trying to get in my mouth, bro. <laughs> Boss. Oh, no. Oh, Lordy. I, I, I totally forgot where I was. Uh, <laughs> oh, shit. Right, that's funny that that happened right when I was talking about Cooper Cup tearing his ACL. That fucking sucks. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, on against the Seahawks on November 11th in 2018, Cooper Cup tears his ACL. You know, as a fan, I was absolutely crushed and automatically doubted their success. I feel like I feel like that's how I am, like a, like a toxic fan. It's like once something bad happens, I'm like, oh, it's over. It's fucking done. Like I can't be helped. <laughs> uh, but they kind of proved me wrong. Even though that season ended in an L, they proved they were almost there. They never stopped fighting. They were a touchdown and a field goal off of winning the Super Bowl. They almost made it. This ties back into last episode with Dave Chappelle saying, I fall. I get up. I stand tall. I fall. You know, that's life. But they never lost faith and nor turned their backs on one another. And that's one takeaway we can bring into our own lives is the idea of winning and losing together. So I was going to say that this idea is hard to learn for people who have never played any pro sports. Now I didn't kill it. Oh my God, dude. Okay, this is going to actually piss me off now. Okay, this, this motherfucker is so active right now. Holy shit. Uh, and it's like so small too. I can't really kill it without, with like, like a, I have this little electric like fly killer, but that thing is, that thing is way too small. It's not going to get electrified. 
oh, dude, this this motherfucker is really active right now. It's like zipping around all over the place. <sighs> I opened up my little thing of coconut water, so I was hoping that it would like fly in there and I could just like trap it, but it doesn't seem like it's that interested in the coconut water. Oh God. I don't know if I should cut this out or not, to be completely honest. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. This I knew this little motherfucker was going to come in this shit. It's zipping around. I see it on my screen. Now it's gone. Let me just... Okay, I was going to say that this idea is hard to learn for people who have never played any sports. But I personally know some very selfish dudes who played sports. So it's not a lesson that everyone learns. Sports in general is a beautiful thing. Seeing the narratives of all over the season, you can get as granular as you want. Focus on one player, style of play, or even coach. The NFL season has, a, has practically started. And my guy Nathaniel asks me, what are my AFC and NFC predictions? Championship predictions. Before I answer this and give my predictions, I'd like to add some context for people who are not into this stuff. You know, the MLB, NBA, NFL, NHL are all leagues, like pro sports leagues. But inside these leagues, they're like split up into two conferences. I fucking got him. He's on my hands right now. Yes, sir. Let's go. Oh, my God. That Okay, that's awesome. I'm so glad I got this little bitch ass. Okay, I'm going to have to go just wipe my hands now. I will be back. Oh, man, I got it. And I swear to God, if another one shows up, I might just lose it. <laughs> I don't. OK, I'm, I'm back anyways. Um, and also, if you guys do hear my um, fans like whirring in the background, like the if you guys hear that, um, I'm sorry, I do have the noise removal thing on, so you guys shouldn't hear it, but it's so hot, and I'm recording this at 10.26 p.m. It is so fucking hot right now, actually. It's, like, disgusting. So it's 10, it's 10.26 p.m., and it's fucking 80 degrees. Oh, Lord. Oh, my God. It's fucking 80 degrees still. It's ridiculous. I mean, it could be worse, but oh God, dude, the high today is, oh God, 102. This is the weather news uh, section of this. <laughs> it's so hot where I'm at. It's not, it's actually really fucking bad. Um, Y'all wear your sunscreen out there, please. It's way too hot and the sun is going to kill us. Now I got to remember where I was. I think I was answering Nathaniel. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So Nathaniel asked me what are my ASC and NSC championship predictions. So the NFL is split up into two. Um, it's split up into the AFC and the NFC. I believe it's the AFC is the American Football Conference and the NFC is the National Football Conference. Um, and then the last team in each of the AFC and the NFC, they face off in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, it's your standard fare. It's a, it's a little bit different in the NFL. And I feel like some of the, um, you know, some of the divisions, they don't really make sense. But I would just have to look at it and kind of see like the geography and stuff like that. Some of them do, but some of them don't. Like, like I feel like, honestly, the Raiders should be in the... Um, same division that the Rams and the Niners are in. Um, I don't know what team you would take out, but I feel like the Raiders should should be in our division, but for some reason they're not. And <laughs> but if you're a Raiders fan hearing that, I know y'all would be mad because our division's actually like pretty competitive most of the time, or at least uh, the past few seasons they have been. But that's besides the point. So Nate here is specifically asking me who will be the last four teams standing and, oh, man, you know, this is actually going to be kind of tough for me to answer without sounding like an idiot. But let's give it a shot. 
I think the AFC Championship game <laughs> will be the Dolphins versus Chargers, and the NFC Championship game will be Niners versus Cowboys. Pains me to say the Niners are going to make it to the NFC Championship as a Rams fan, but as a fan of football and the NFL, I do want to see this matchup at least one more time. But um, sorry for any Rams fans out there. We're going to be probably pretty fucking booty cheeks this year. And a side note, if this Niners versus Cowboys game ends in Dak being an absolute idiot, I'm going to really fucking cry of laughter. Like, like I'm never, I'm never going to stop like talking about that shit because it's going to be so funny. I guess this is a little side note on the Cowboys. It's, it's actually really funny to me that the Cowboys always lose in like really like historic fashion. You could even think back to, you know, when Dak was playing with, um, I forgot what that guy's name is. Tony Romo, I think. Not Dak. Uh, fuck. What's that guy's name? Dez. Dez. Dez Bryant and Tony Romo. Like one of the games it ended in him like really catching the ball and he caught it he caught it and like kind of landed before the touchdown, but then, you know, he like fought for the yards for the touchdown. But then, but then because he did that, because he fought for those yards, they ruled it as an incomplete. <laughs> Dude, if any Cowboys fans are hearing this right now, I know they're having PTSD. And then a couple of years ago against the Niners, you know, they have like 40 seconds or 50 seconds left in the game. Um, they're like a little bit past midway. So, the, you know, they're they're creeping closer to like either scoring a field goal or a touchdown. They don't have any timeouts. And then this dude, Doc, just decides to run the ball up the middle. <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> but yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be the Niners versus uh, Cowboys like. And that'd be crazy. So I got Dolphins versus Chargers and uh, Niners versus Cowboys. And um, shout out to Nate for the question. This uh, whole segment pretty much was because of you. So I wanted to talk about the Rams and stuff like that. And by the way, if I, if I were to get a Rams jersey, which is actually unfortunate, I don't have one yet. I only actually have one jersey from, the, from my actual teams. And um, that's a Reggie Jackson jersey. <laughs> from the Clippers and he's not even on the Clippers no more but shout out to Reggie too because he won a championship all right as a little interlude if you will I'm going to be talking about a favorite aspect uh, my favorite aspect of football you know I like to look at some things a little bit more closely than other things some things to keep an eye on during the game for football one thing I like to keep an eye on is the possession game. That entails, you know, seeing how long both the offense and the defense is on the field and seeing how each team kind of leverages that. Because I feel like the best teams, they don't want to overplay their offense or their defense. So I, I like to see how that's managed. And then the second thing, this kind of goes hand in hand with like the possession game or the time of possession is turnovers, whether that be by fumbles, picks, incomplete fourth down attempts. You know, great teams try to balance out offense and defense play on the field. So neither side are too gassed. And like I said, the turnovers go hand in hand in that because I've seen one pick or one interception or a fumble literally changed the tide of the whole outcome of the game. This goes back to the Rams versus the Buccaneers back in um, 2022 in their uh, Super Bowl run. They were killing the Buccaneers. And then all of a sudden, Cam Akers runs the ball, fumbles. They, they lose it before halftime. And it's like, you know, are they going to carry that on their shoulders? throughout the rest of the game? Or are they going to keep on continuing to stomp on them as they were doing? And what did they do? They, can, they carried it on their shoulders and they kept it on their minds. And, you know, they started to throw interceptions and, and you know, started to fumble more and started to fuck up a little bit more. 
And then all of a sudden, it was a tie game. <laughs> it's literally by miracle we won that shit. And people say that the Rams had such an easy path to the Super Bowl. Like we, would, we didn't face these great teams. They just hate him, though. Um, do I want to talk about other aspects I like about other sports? Hmm. Um, maybe. You know, I like the, I definitely like the possession game in basketball too, but basketball is more of a, more of a game of runs instead of like how much you have the possession of the ball. That does matter, of course, because obviously if you have more possession of the ball than that, it means you're kind of controlling the pace of the game. No, I guess, yeah, no, the possession game is something I love about basketball too. <laughs> Um, I also love mid-ranges in basketball. I know people hate mid-ranges nowadays, but a little midi sets up a lot more than what people think. And also, mid-ranges, they help, you know, kill the bleeding. So let's just say a team is going on like a 10-2 to 2 run, and they're like trying to really lock up on defense, but they're giving you an open, you know, pick and pop mid-range with your big man. Or with, like, maybe you can, like, run a little pick and pop with, like, a small forward point guard. And, you know, he shoots the mid-range. That kind of keeps the defense honest if he makes it. And that leads him to maybe, like, having more of, like, a path to the rim the next time he gets the ball. You know, it's, it's kind of like a setup move. Like, the same thing in, in baseball. It's like, how are you going to set up that curveball? Or how are you going to set up the slider or the circle change? Oh, there's another one. Jesus Christ. This motherfucker came out from the dead. I don't know how that happened. That's actually so annoying. Oh my God, this one's big too. I really be predicting shit. I knew another one was going to come out from somewhere. That's so gross. All right, so the next segment that I'm going to be talking about is we're going to get a little bit more personal. You know, I was talking about the Rams a little bit and how they relate to me and stuff, but I got this segment titled What I've Been Up To. You know, the main thing is I've been playing more of the Switch. And at this point, the Switch is kind of an underpowered console. You, you can say it's as powerful as like a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox 360. But for me especially playing it in handheld, you know, I don't notice that lack of performance as much. When playing games in handheld, the magic is still there and it still feels impressive to this day. But then when I dock the Switch and see it on the TV, it kind of loses its charm. Um, so the first game that I was playing on the Switch recently is Octopath Traveler 2. As I was alluding to last week, I did drop this game, but... Um, I did give it a chance. I grabbed all eight characters and finished all of their chapter ones. And I believe for the wizard Oswald, his, his first chapter covers both chapter one and two. So I've played both his. And I think I've even played some of Throne because she was my main character. But, you know, I grabbed all the eight characters. At least I did that. And then the combat, it's pretty much just turn-based combat. It boils down to targeting enemies' weak points and breaking their guard. Weak points can be elemental-based or based on weapons, like aka swords, bows, axe, and stuff like that. You find these weak points as you attack the enemies. So if you hit them with like a fire attack and they are weak to fire, then it will show up like on the bottom of um, like where their health bar is or whatever. I don't think there's a health bar in the I don't think there is a health bar in the game, but I think it just shows up at the bottom like where their name is at or whatever. One takeaway from the game is that the art style is really gorgeous. The devs call it HD 2D, so it has an HD 2D art style. And to me it feels very cozy. And that's the main word that I would like to say for this game is it feels very cozy. And I've kind of had it described as like a like pixel art um portraits and panels so it's, it's it's a really beautiful looking game a con that i have for the game is i wish that the characters uh, had a deeper connection with each other 
each of the main characters and their stories are kind of to themselves. They don't really involve other characters that much. Like you might have dialogue and battles and stuff like that mentioning characters. And I believe I got to a point where I had a paths crossed mission, but I ended up not doing that one. And at the end of the day, it kind of just wasn't what I was really looking for. And for some reason, while I was playing it, I kind of just felt like getting into ba getting back into Final Fantasy fourteen, and that's that's an MMO. If you guys don't know what that is, massively multiplayer online game. And I have FF fourteen, but um, the reason why I didn't like get back into it is because that game has like a monthly subscription model that you have to um, subscribe to, and I think it's like fourteen ninety nine a month to even play the game. So I really do have to like put aside time if I really wanted to play it and I I didn't want to commit to it yet. Um so I decided to uh pick up a game called Xenoblade Chronicles. I seen it was um on Amazon for like like $10 off and um I literally grabbed like the last copy at least at the time. It said it said only one copy left. So I was like fuck yeah, I just want to grab it. But the main reason why I picked this up was because um Mr. Gene Park, shout out to Gene Park of um, Washington Post. But um, he's on this podcast called Punching Up, and he was like raving about it. And he says like, this is like one of his favorite games. And me personally, I like to check out all the favorite games of the LSM crew. And, um, you know, shout out to LSM too. If you guys, if listening, don't know who that is, Last Stand Media. And they have all these, uh, they have all these good shows and stuff. And these shows are the main things that I listen to and I like um, inspired off of them. You know, those, those are the giants and I'm the little, you know, I'm the little Kratos on their shoulders. <laughs> it's funny because I'm pretty sure Colin has said that he sees Joe Rogan as like this Titan or this like Colossus. And he sees like him as like the one, the little one that's on their shoulder that's like riding on the back. But it's, but I see him as like the Colossus. So it's, it's just crazy how um, shit goes around. But uh, yeah, I like to check out all the games from the LSM crew. You know, I I know Cog really likes Yakuza Like a Dragon, and I like the, the Yakuza series. I've played Zero, I've played Kiwami One and Two, but I never played Like a Dragon, and. He said that he liked it, so I was like, fuck it, let me check that out. That was, like, sometimes last year, and I'm pretty sure Chris was even raving about it, too, back then. But, you know, like, Cog, Cog said he liked Like a Dragon, so I was like, fuck it, let me check this shit out. I feel like me and Colin just like kind of like the same game, so it's like, there's not one specific game I could say about him. But I would say he has encouraged me to check out a lot of stuff over the years. Or not encouraged me, like, specifically, but, like, through his shows and stuff like that, for sure. Because I've never actually had a conversation with them. <laughs> um, Chris, you know, Chris loves Halo. And um, Chris loves Destiny. I've played both Halo and Destiny. I'm not too fond of Destiny, but for sure I love Halo still. Well, what game has Dagon championed? I, I, I completely don't know. Street Fighter? Street Fighter 2? I've never played that one, but I, I played Street Fighter 6. <laughs> um, now, now it got me thinking. Who am I missing? Dustin. Well, I know Dustin loves Nier. Uh, I've played like I've played. So Nier split up into three sections, right? There's 2B, then there's the guy, and then there's 2S or some shit like that. I've beat the 2B section, but I never went back and played the other 9S, I think it was. Damn, I don't remember too much about it, but, you know, Nier, he loves Kingdom Hearts. Or at least he used to love Kingdom Hearts, and I, I actually really enjoy Kingdom Hearts even though it's fucking nonsense, pretty much. And I admit that. What am I missing here? Oh, Maddie. <laughs> um, well, Maddie loves Octopath, and that's the main reason why I wanted to check out Octopath is because he, like, recommended it on, on his YouTube. And I don't know if it's still going to be his game of the year, which I don't know. This, game, this year is stacked, but I feel like that might be in, in his game of the year list for sure, if he still remembers it. But, um... Yeah, but on Xenoblade, you know, Gene's more of like a newcomer on the LSM. So, you know, I want to see what he was raving about. You know, I wanted to check out his taste and stuff like that. Like test his taste, you could say. 
And um, surprisingly, it's kind of what I'm craving for. Like I was saying earlier, I wanted to get back into F14. So I kind of knew to myself, like, oh, I do want to play like an MMO-like game, but I don't want to pay for a subscription service for a game. I just rather just buy a game and just have it and play it. But yeah, this uh, this game is very MMO-like. And like I said, it's surprisingly what I'm craving for. Um, I'm around like eight, nine hours in. I believe I'm on chapter five, level like 20 or something, 21. And yeah, I'm playing a lot of it, especially on handheld. I know that it looks very soft, like the resolution is low. I don't know specifically what it is, but it does look very soft to my eyes. And um, yeah, the game runs at 30, of course, and it does actually have very bad um, like frame, frame rate drops, especially in cutscenes and like in the open world. And this is just a hunch, but I feel like Xenoblade Chronicles, it inspired the Breath of the Wild team. Because as I'm playing in this world, I'll, I'll give an example. I was on my way to a main quest, but I was also doing side quests on the way. And how this game tackles side quests is also very MMO-like, where it's like they don't really matter. They're mainly just for the experience and gear and stuff. So the game, it just allows you to just accept every side quest and then once you complete them in the world at least for most of them they just complete on their own so once you once you're in the world and you complete the side quest um it just pops up on the on the screen that you've completed the side quest and that's cool like you don't have to go back to the person that gave it to you but if it's like like um like a named person in the city like a person with an actual name then I feel like if they give you a side quest, those are the more important ones where you do have to go back and forth, like travel out into the world and then go back to them and stuff like that. I feel like Xenoblade is inspired by, or inspired Breath of the Wild at least a little bit or the team that made Breath of the Wild because it's really open and vast. Um, art style wise, they're kind of similar, but in this way where it was like, I was on my way to a main objective And I thought I was on the, also on the path of completing this side objective. But then I realized this side objective was on a, like a cliff, like above me. So I couldn't reach it. And in the game, there are vines that you could climb up and stuff. So I was like, let me start looking for it. Maybe there's some around here so I can get up there. And there wasn't. So I was like, you know, maybe that's a, that's a way that the Breath of the Wild team like looked. It's like, like, oh, like. At this point, we could climb this. And that's why I also really do like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom because they have this idea of just being like open and being able to do that. Like you don't need the game to have like a vine right here that you can climb and only that thing to climb. You could just climb up the surface of this rock or the surface of this cliff. But that's just a hunch though. Playing both Octopath Traveler and Xenoblade Chronicles, I feel like this might sound weird, but it's like they kind of feel like the Pokemon games I've never played in a weird way. With Octopath, it's, you know, each each character specializes in some some specific things and you have to go out into the world and get them just like the Pokemon where it's like, you know, each Pokemon have a different elemental attack that they do. And they and they both they all have weaknesses that they kind of exploit. Same thing with Octopath. It's like each character has specific things that makes them strong. And with Xenoblade, less like Pokemon because it's more of an active game instead of a turn-based game. But it's... I'm seeing it's like as I'm traveling through the world, I feel like in ways this is like a Pokemon game. Or like I can see how it could be a Pokemon game because I'm just walking through the field with my um, crew members or I'm just walking through the field with my squad and like I turn around and I see them following me just like how like you can see like your Pokemon's following you some, in some of the games. And then I could just imagine, you know, running around and then seeing all these monsters in this game, but them actually being Pokemon instead of being monsters. I feel like whoever made the Xenoblade Chronicles games, they should be able to help out on a Pokemon game. I feel like that, that's like a match made in heaven. But yeah, I haven't beat it. I'm only on chapter five, eight hours in. It's Xenoblade Chronicles. Probably talked about it a little too much. <laughs>
Um, Siege. You know, I'm back to the place that it got me here initially. Little known fact, this YouTube channel was actually started because of Siege. And, because, and specifically because I was playing it on console back in 2020. Um, shout out to my guys, uh, Mayor and Quentin, you know, back on that console siege because of them. You know, I don't want to just play that game by myself. And uh, some games I'm looking forward to this month, for sure. Unfortunately, um, you know, this little game called Starfield comes out next month and um, comes out actually really soon. So I don't know how much time I'm going to have. And I picked a fucking long game to play. So I don't know if I'm even going to be able to beat it. But um, I'm hoping to get my hands on Armored Core 6. Contemplating either the PC or the PS5 version. And a game called Sea of Stars. Uh, it comes out on Games Pass. And I think it comes out on PlayStation Plus too. Um, the art style for that game just looks really gorgeous. And it's very intriguing. It's... It's catching my eye for sure. Some other things that I've done this week. I watched this movie called Dune. Sure, you guys have, must have heard of it. I watched it last week. And the director of Dune, his name is Denis Villeneuve. He's a, I believe he's either Canadian or French. And I have seen some of this guy's movies. And I, I enjoy him as a director. And in my eyes, he is also an auteur, as I was saying earlier or I was saying last, or last to last week. I also finished Dune and finished Max Payne 3 on the same day. So I think that's like the first that I've ever done that where I've beat a game, both a game and a movie in the same day. And Max Payne 3 was the gameplay that y'all saw in my video last week. And I actually think that's some of my best gameplay, even though I'm fucking around a lot of it. But um, some other things that I have been up to going to the gym of course i i feel like in the last all of the episodes i've opened with saying oh i've came back from the gym and from work and all that and you know the same as as usual was today i went to work and then i went to the gym and i was actually so tired that i just took a nap and then yeah woke up from the nap ate some food shout out to my girl made me some food <laughs> um but yeah, I've been going to the gym. I've kind of switched my approach. I was doing like, you know, heavy weight lifting first instead of, you know, working on conditioning in my body and stuff like that, working on being explosive. So I'm kind of switching to like a more cardio based where I'm still having my lift days, but I really want to push my uh, explosiveness. Seeing this fly flying around again. At the end of the day, I'm just trying to build my endurance. So yeah, that's what I've been up to. All right, we're moving to the end of the show. And I just wanted to kind of pose a question. You know, I, I kind of like to leave you guys thinking a little bit. Pulling up something on my computer. <laughs> that I forgot to earlier. Oh God. Okay, let me make this a little bigger. The telephony. <laughs> um, yeah, pos posing a little question for you guys. I just want to keep you guys thinking a little bit. And, you know, I don't want to be cliche here, but I want to talk about the meaning of life. been thinking about this a lot lately. I feel like the answer is within the word itself. You know, we complicate things too much. That's why we are in the positions we are in right now. The meaning of life is to live. We must live by fully enjoying both the big and the little stuff. I personally know I love to focus on the little things. The big stuff only comes around so often. But at the end of the day, those few episodes of your favorite show, or squatting up with the boys, or those precious few movie nights with your significant other, those things are going to carry us. They're going to help us keep us going. You know, at the end, I guess I just want to plug myself a little bit. I have this YouTube channel, as you guys know, Sue Bagels, youtube.com slash Sue Bagels. I also have a Patreon, so if you guys would like to um, support me financially, if you want to, it's uh, patreon.com slash Sue Bagels. 
I'm on there. Um, I'm also on Discord. So if you join the Patreon, you get to join my Discord. Um, you guys can also uh, DM me or uh, follow me on my socials and Instagrams and all that. I wanted to talk about the console wars and fanboys today, but you know I already had this show written out, so it's just gonna have to wait till the next one. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart for watching, listening. Shout out to my soul patron, Selena. And now I'm going to be reading an intro letter from Hogwarts Legacy in a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. We are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry as a fifth year student. Terms begin on 1st of September. Preliminary supplies have been collected for you and will accompany you on your journey to the castle. As you may be aware, the decree of reasonable restrictions of underage sorcery prohibits the use of magic by those of the... <laughs> this is a long ass sentence. <sighs> reasonable restrictions of underage sorcery prohibit the use of magic by those under the age of 17 outside school. However, due to your unique circumstances, the ministry has graciously agreed to allow Professor Elazar Fig to help you hone your spell casting before escorting you from London to the castle for the start of the feast and the sorting ceremony. Yours sincerely, Professor Weasley. <laughs> I don't know. Y'all can judge that. All right. Peace out, guys. <laughs>